Hi, my name's Pastor Russell. I'm one of the pastors at Ranui Baptist Church in West Auckland. I want to take a few minutes to share with you how to connect with God. And I want to do that specifically from the Bible. But I'm not going to refer to the Bible and read quotes to you. Everything I'm about to say comes out of scriptures. The Bible is God's book. It's incredibly accurate. It's been translated year after year very, very carefully. It's historically accurate. It's full of prophecies that have been fulfilled, most of them already fulfilled, a few yet to happen. It's written by witnesses, and therefore you can trust the Bible. You're living in a world where there are lots of people saying there are different gods, there are different ways to get to know God. But God wanted to keep it plain and simple for you and me, because he wants a relationship with us. I think one of the most important things about God is God is a holy person. He's a holy being, much greater than us, much more powerful than us. And I think people realize that God is a loving God, that God is creator. Most of the folk I've spoken to from different religions, from different backgrounds, would acknowledge that there is a God and God is loving. But the issue they don't seem to understand about God is that God is holy and he wants to know you personally. If you look at the Old Testament, that first half of the Bible, it explains to us that God is good and he's holy and he's perfect and you and I aren't. One of the most best known passages in the Ten Commandments is where Moses speaks about, about in the Old Testament, is where Moses speaks about the Ten Commandments. And in the Ten Commandments, we understand what holiness looks like. You and I might think, look, we don't attack old ladies, we don't rob banks, uh, we're very polite on the road, therefore we're good people. But you look at the Ten Commandments and you just begin to unpack them and you realise we're not good people, not by God's holy standard. And we too need a saviour, we need help that was sent in the person of Jesus. I and mean, ask yourself the question, have you ever told a lie? The Bible says if you tell a lie, then you are a liar. And if you're a liar, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever stolen something big or small? I used to steal fruit off the neighbor's tree as a kid, or stationery from other kids in, in the class at school. And the Bible would say if you steal anything, no thief will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Ever use the name of God or Jesus as a swear word or an expletive uh, way of expressing yourself? The Bible makes it very clear in the Ten Commandments, blasphemy. Those that blaspheme will have no part in the kingdom of God. Ever been rude to your parents? Ever not put God first? Maybe put other things as a priority, even your family, before God. Ever not taken a day off a week to rest and to think about God and to look after your family? Ever uh, hated somebody and gone to sleep without forgiving that person, without putting it right? Jesus said that's like murdering a person in your heart. The Bible's very clear, we're not to sleep with people we're not married to. But Jesus said, not only that, if you entertain the idea, if you think about having sex with someone you're not married to, then you've committed adultery of the heart. Now, I'm not going to ask you how you do on those kinds of questions, because all of us have sinned. Romans 8, verse 32 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you think you're perfect, read the Old Testament. If you realise you're not perfect, and you need help, you need help to connect with God, then the New Testament's where you need to begin. I found that when people are little, uh, they don't make mistakes because they're sinning, they don't do things wrong because they know it's wrong. If a baby cries, that baby's hungry. If, if a baby cries, maybe the baby's uncomfortable, maybe it needs a nappy change. But by the time that child's five to seven years of age, no matter what culture, no matter what religious background you come from, that child has a sense of something missing in their lives. That child is beginning to say, look, when the music's turned off, when I'm not having something new happen to me, when there's not people around me, when it's quiet, I feel like something's missing. And the reality is something is missing. You are made for God. You're not a mistake. You are made to be connected to God. And yet our sins, even one sin, causes us to be imperfect, nothing like the God who made us and that causes a problem. That causes that sense of emptiness, feeling lost that you feel when you're not getting a new haircut or buying a car or getting a promotion. The reality is you don't need those things to be happy. What you need is God and God in your life and that's what he wants so much. Many people have said to me over the years, look Russell, um, God's a loving God, we get that. And therefore if I make mistakes, if I, if I sin, God's going to love me anyway. Surely he wouldn't judge me and send me to hell one day. Friends, hell's a reality. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. There's many people I've spoken to who've had after-death experiences, and hell is a real place. And whether someone goes to heaven or to hell, 
is all dependent upon your response to that person, Jesus Christ. Some folk have said to me, Russell, I do the bad things I do because I had a bad dad. I've got a stressful life and therefore I'm abusive, therefore I drink too much, therefore I get angry and say harsh things. Imagine this, if you were to stand before a judge, a fair judge, a caring judge, and say, judge, I've had a very difficult life and therefore I robbed the bank, or therefore I got drunk out of stress and I hit somebody, or I ran a child over on the road. If that judge is a fair judge, even a loving judge, and you say, judge, I just want to go home. I'm sorry I killed that child being drunk. I've had a tough life. You, I'm sure you're a loving judge. You'll forgive me. Consider for a moment what a fair and just judge would do. I believe it. A loving judge, a caring judge who's fair, would punish us and send us to prison. God is fair. He's ultimately fair. And he says one sin disqualifies you from a relationship with him and from eternal life with him in heaven. You can't take a polluted person and put that person into heaven and still call it heaven. In fact, when people have got close to God in the Old Testament, they've begun to see God or sense them at a distance. They've trembled in fear, even the holiest people you can imagine, because they're about to die in the very presence of God. That sin issue has to be dealt with. And nothing you can and I can do can deal with that sin issue. All the false religions of the world will say, if you do this, if you do that, if you knock on enough doors, if you uh, meet their requirements, you might out earn, um, you might outdo your bad things that you've done and end up with salvation. The Bible says that we've all sinned, we fall short of the glory of God and there's no way we in our own power can connect with God. And that's what the New Testament's about. It's about a God that loved us from before the beginning of creation, saying, oh, I can see that you've mucked up, I can see that you've sinned, it's got to be dealt with, it's got to be cleansed away, but I'll do it for you. And so God sends his son in Jesus, who lives a perfect life. Jesus, being God the Son, he always existed, lives a perfect life, and he dies in your place, in my place. Friends, it can take a long time to work out who is Jesus. There's some wonderful things on YouTube, where uh, the Alpha Talks, and in the UK you can stream on the talks, Who is Jesus? Why did he die? Uh, there's lots of studies from any church you can find working out who is Jesus. We would never want to push you to resolve that issue quickly. You need to work out in your own mind who really is Christ. He claimed to be God. He said he was from God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Bible refers to Jesus as part of the Trinity, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He said, you can't know the Father without knowing me. And so the biggest issue when it comes to salvation is resolving that question, who is Jesus? And any good church, and certainly we, would love to help you with that. After Christ went back to heaven, there were 120 people in an upper room having a quiet prayer meeting, uh, kind of really worried about maybe uh, they might get persecuted, they might be found by the Roman guards and those who weren't happy about Jesus. And while they're having that prayer meeting, waiting for the Holy Spirit, not even knowing who the Holy Spirit really was, the Holy Spirit came upon them. The Bible says there were tongues of fire on their heads. They each began to speak in a prayer language, which was known to the people around them, worshipping God in that prayer language. They suddenly changed from timid people, worried about being overheard, to bold people. One of the boldest of all was a man called Peter. He's historically referred to as Big Peter, the fisherman, a huge man. And as him and the other 120 people came down from that upper room and began to just speak in tongues in public, a huge group of people had come to worship at the temple, gathered around thousands of people, people from Ethiopia, people from Egypt, people from the nations around who really wanted to know the God of the Bible. They heard God being worshipped in their own language perfectly, and they were amazed. And then Peter stood up and preached, I think, one of the most in-your-face blunt sermons ever preached. I'm sure he said, if you've ever lied, you won't make it to heaven. If you've dishonored your parents, you won't make it to heaven. If you sleep with someone you're not married to, you won't make it to heaven. But the Bible specifically right records that he said they had stoned the prophets and rejected God's messages. That they had actually had God the Son nailed to a tree, crucified. People are listening to Peter tell the truth. Telling the truth because he loved them. And they responded. They said, Peter... If this is true about Jesus, if Jesus, who we've just seen crucified and is now miraculously missing, raised from the dead, if this is all true, and Peter, we believe, what must we do to be saved? Remembering that faith in who Christ is is the most critical thing. 
This is what Peter's response was. They said to Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Acts 2.38 Repent, said Peter. That means turn from your sins. That means confess your sins. That means say, God, specifically, I'm sorry I did this. I said that. Help me go the other way. And be baptized, every one of you. To be baptized means to be plunged under water after you've come to faith and repented. A baby can't do it. It has to be someone with faith who's turned from their sins. When you're baptized, God supernaturally makes you part of his family. It's part of the cleansing process. In fact, there are many scriptures that talk about how we are cleansed through the waters of baptism. Then he says, after faith and repentance and water baptism, he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. In other words, once you've been baptized in water, you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit too. And wonderful things begin to happen. You're able to pray in a prayer language you've never learned before. You're able to hear God's voice, and that's the best thing of all, far more easily, more readily than you ever have previously. If you come across an evil spirit, you've got authority to deal with it. You'll pray for sick people and some of them will be healed. A whole range of things will take place when you receive the Holy Spirit. That begins a normal Christian life. Often people have said to me, look, Pastor, I believe in God, but I don't want to give up my drinking. Or I believe in God and I've said sorry for my sins, but I've never been baptized in water with the Holy Spirit. Am I a normal Christian? Now, the answer to that, according to Scripture, is no. You're not a normal Christian. So there's some wonderful things happening, and we celebrate that. But if you picture the four legs of a chair, a strong, stable chair has four legs on it. And in the biblical account of how people are converted, and this is a pattern for the whole of the New Testament from Acts 2.38 forward, people are converted when they work out who is Jesus. Is he really God the Son as he claimed to be? Is he really the one who can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? The Bible describes Jesus as being the Word of God who always existed, or the Alpha and Omega. And you need to take time to work out, is what he claimed about his life true? Is Jesus really God? Is he the only way to God? Once that's been established, just like Peter said to these people, you need to confess your sins. You need to be baptized in water. You need to receive the person of the Holy Spirit upon you. Then a normal Christian life has begun. So if those four things haven't happened, you're a person God loves. God's dealing with you, but you're not yet a normal Christian person. I want to say to your friends too, once you've made that transition, you've trusted in Christ, and those four things have happened together, you're like a little seedling, like a little kauri tree. You're vulnerable, and it's really, really important how you're going to live your life from that moment onwards. I've often said to people, hey, Satan's scared of you being a Christian. He's had you, whether or not you've known it for a long time. And once you come into the kingdom, it's kind of like you're a little kauri tree. Now, he's not going to be able to cope with you when you're a mature kauri tree. You're strong and you have significant influence over the spiritual realm and over people. If there's a time in your life where he wants to stop you going to church, if there's a time in your life where he wants to push your buttons or send people from the past along to upset you, it's going to be in those first couple of months after you've come into the kingdom. Friends, be very strong and be very disciplined in all your Christian walk, but particularly in that time. About 10 years ago, a very, very gifted pastor from America wrote this book, What on Earth Am I Here For? A man called Rick Warren. And he summarizes what the whole New Testament teaches about living the Christian life. He says there's five fundamental things you need to have in your life to keep growing in God and getting stronger and having an impact upon your world, letting your life really make a difference. Having an impact upon your kids and your spouse and those around you that you care about. He summarized them in this way. He said, worship is one of those things. Every Christian needs to learn to worship. Now, singing is a good thing. I can't sing. In fact, the mic's often turned down when I am singing in church. But singing's only part of worship. It's really about an attitude. It's about an attitude of gratitude. And God wants you to live a thankful life where you just give him thanks for the big and the little things. The small answered prayers and the big answered prayers. The little blessings that come your way each day. God wants you to fellowship with other Christians. That's number two. You need to be part of a church every week. And if you can hang out with other Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, more often than that, you're going to find you'll hear miracles. You'll have your faith built up. You'll hear testimonies. You'll see demons defeated. You'll see people healed all the time. And that's vital for your faith. 
Thirdly, God calls you to serve him. And he'll call you to serve him quite uniquely. He won't ask you to be like me. He won't ask you to be like your spouse or your friend or somebody else. He'll put a dream in your heart. And he'll give you spiritual gifts to fulfill that dream. And as you do what God calls you to do, you'll get closer and closer to the God who made you, who just loves your company so much. Fourthly, he'll want to disciple you. Now put simply, that means just he wants you to learn to listen to his voice and obey what he says by the Holy Spirit and obey what he says through the Bible. Uh, every time you say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to do that. I'm going to help that poor kid. I'm going to pray for that sick person. I'm going to speak a word to that person I've never met before because you've told me to. You begin to be shaped more and more into the character of God himself, into the character of his son, Jesus Christ. And finally, God wants you to share your faith in a way that's natural for you. You don't have to be like anyone else. You don't have to follow a program. But God wants you just to share, talk about Jesus and your experiences and what the Bible says about Jesus in a way that's natural for you. Friends, if you do those five things once you're a Christian, you'll not only enjoy your relationship with God, you'll live a meaningful life. You'll live a purposeful life. You'll live a life that you're made for. That's what God wants. One last thing I want to say before I conclude. This world's full of a whole lot of voices. This world's full of people saying, just do your own thing. God said there's one way to connect with God, through His Son, Jesus Christ. He said the road to destruction, the road to emptiness, the road eventually to hell is broad, it's easy. But the road to God, the road to a powerful life, a meaningful life, it's straight and it's narrow. I just want to say, I really pray you choose a narrow road. God bless you.